good to you. Would you worship him right now? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Oh, hallelujah, every provision, God, every benefit. Oh, hallelujah, every answered prayer, Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. There isn't a God like unto you. You are the one true and living God. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Well, has the Lord been good to you? Hallelujah. I heard a man say one time, he's been better to me than I've been to myself. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says that if you feed yourself and take care of yourself, that you love yourself. And it looks like everybody here ate this week. And you had something to drink. But God is better to you than you are to yourself. In fact, he knows more about you than you know about yourself. Hallelujah. The scripture says that the very hairs of your head are numbered. It didn't say they were counted. It says they were numbered. So when one falls out, he knows which number fell out. He's just not keeping a tab of how many you have, but he knows which number. Think about it. He knows which numbered hair fell out. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. Oh, hallelujah. That's the kind of God, that's how interested he is in you and in me. That's how much care he has put into making you and taking care of you. Oh, hallelujah. What a Savior we have this morning. What a God we have that he knows that much about us and he still cares about us and he's still concerned about us and he still loves us and he still cares for us. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful that when people don't believe in us, How many of us have been kicked to the curb, forgotten about, looked over, looked down at? Hallelujah. But in the kingdom of God, you are somebody. Hallelujah. You are somebody. Hallelujah. I feel the anointing of God. Sister Smith, you are somebody. Hallelujah. You are not just a wife to a Brother Smith, but you are somebody in and of your own right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We each have an identity that God has given to us. Hallelujah. Are special. I wonder this morning, we're always talking about the Lord giving us blessings and us receiving from the Lord, receiving the Holy Ghost, being baptized and receiving, receiving from the Lord, and that's fine. And we're in this Christmas season, and the Lord has given us a great opportunity. The wells and springs of salvation were provided to you and I by him coming. He was a special gift to the world. I wonder this morning, what would be your special gift to the Lord this Christmas season? He doesn't need money. He doesn't need a new sweater or a pair of socks.
what he desires more than anything else is for a relationship with you. And I'm not talking about it, church. That's all well and good. It's okay to come to church. It's, it's scriptural. It's wonderful to worship together. It's wonderful to hear the preaching. It's, and that's all needful. But I'm talking about a personal relationship with God. I'm not talking about asking God for things. I'm not talking about praying and, and seeking God to get a sermon. I'm not talking about praying and seeking God to minister to someone else. I'm talking about a personal relationship with God. All those other things will come out of that relationship. Ministry and preaching and teaching and, and witnessing and being a soul. winner. That will all come out of that. But I'm talking about a personal relationship with God. You may be seated. Jacob was the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. He was the twin brother to Esau. Rebekah, their mother, had a rough time carrying the twins, and she inquired of the Lord as to why they were struggling inside her or why there was such a struggle. And the Lord told her that you're going to have uh, twins, and you have two nations inside of you, inside the womb. And one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. When they were born, Esau was born first, but Jacob's hand took hold on his heel. One day when Esau came in from the field, and he was faint, and he needed something to eat, and Esau asked Jacob, will you feed me? And Jacob said, if you will sell me your birthright. Esau was so hungry and didn't realize the importance of his birthright, so he sold it to Jacob. And when Isaac, their father, was nearing death, by the help of his mother, Jacob tricked Isaac, his father, into blessing him instead of his brother Esau. When Esau found out what had happened, he vowed to kill his brother. Isaac and Rebekah sent Jacob away to Haran to find a wife at the urging of his mother. She told Jacob, your brother's going to kill you. And I don't like the girls around here. In fact, I don't like my daughter-in-law. I don't like Esau's wife. We always talk about the mother-in-law, but sometimes the daughter-in-laws can be stinkers. Hello, hallelujah, amen, glory to God. <clears throat> and she said, I'm going to send you to Haran, to my brother's house, Laban. And they sent him away. And his uncle was so excited to have him come, and he was just elated. And he welcomed Jacob in, and he was glad that he was there. And, and he met Rachel, and he knew that was the wife for him. She was beautiful. The Bible says, now a lot of people say, well, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and we understand know that, because some people say, man, isn't she beautiful? And you're thinking, wow, yeah, for you. But the Bible says she was very pretty. In fact, when he went with, after he was married, he was afraid to say that that was his wife. In fact, his grandfather did the same thing. He was afraid to say that Sarah was his wife because Sarah was pretty. Don't get nervous. And Laban said, I'm going to pay you, but what are your wages? And he said, I'd like to have your daughter. He said, okay, you work for me seven years. Wow. Wow. What a dowry. You work seven years for that gal, and you can have her. You can walk her down the aisle, and you can have her if you work for me for seven years. 
And he, he agreed. He said, I'll, I'll take her. She's that pretty. I want her that bad. I will work for seven years for that girl. And he did. But he was tricked by leaving his father-in-law. And there was Leah. And she was not pretty. Not just to Jacob, but to others. As we say in West Virginia, she was probably a little homely. She wasn't fair to look upon like Rachel. But he had tricked Jacob. And Jacob said, what have you done to me? I mean, you, you, I, I, he said, well, it's not lawful for me to give my younger daughter before the older daughter. So I had to give her first. And, you know, do you still want Rachel? Well, I mean, for me, I think I would have been very, I don't know, praise God. Uh, but he loved Rachel so much that he decided to work another seven years for her. And he did, and he married her. And then he worked another amount of years, six more years 20 years he worked for Laban. And the Lord blessed him. And every time Laban said, well, if, you have the, if, the, if it's born speckled of the cattle, you can have the speckled, I'll take the rest. Well, then the Lord would bless and all of them were speckled. And, and it just kept on going. And, and, and Jacob was just blessed by God. And then all of a sudden, the sons got a little jealous. And they started talking to Laban, and then Laban's countenance changed toward Jacob. And Jacob said, mm, I don't know his countenance. And the Lord warned him and said, it's time to leave. And so he left. He's got to go home. But he's got to face a major issue. Esau. Because remember, 20 years earlier, he lied. He tricked his father, and Esau said, I'll kill you. And now the Lord said, go back to the land of your fathers. And now he's thinking, wait a minute. You know, I know I have to leave Laban, but do I have to go back? Think about it. I'm not talking about somebody who's just angry with you and, and you're going to have words. I'm talking, he's going to kill you. And he goes back, and he's on his way back, and he sends his messengers out, and he sends them in droves. And it lists, the Bible lists everything he's going to give Esau. This is what I'm going to give you. And he sends his messengers out, and he tells them to tell him, say, uh, Jacob is coming. He's behind us, but this is what he's sending. Your servant is sending you these gifts, and this is what he wants you to have. But he's on his way. He sent them out. He's had his family. He sends them across the brook, and then he's by himself. The scripture says that he was alone, but then he wrestled a man. He knew what he was facing the next day. He knew that God had told him to go back. He knew that God had told him he would keep his hand upon him. At Bethel, he promised God that if you'll keep me and if you'll be with me, I'll give a tenth of everything that I earn, and I, I will be your servant, and I'll, I'll live for you if you do these things. And he was blessed by God at Bethel. He saw God. He saw the angels ascending and descending. It's interesting to me that they ascended, then descended, which means they were already with Jacob. They didn't come down and then go back up. They were down here, and they were going back up and coming back down. God's hand was already upon Jacob, and he said, I'll bless you. I'll keep my hand upon you. Just like I promised Abraham, that blessing is upon you, his grandson. I'll keep you and I'll bless you. And now he's facing Esau. The next morning he's wrestling with this angel all night long. And he's good at it. Because he is prevailing against the angel. Now it's one thing to fight a man and be good. But when you're fighting an angel and you're good, you're good. You've got some authority and you've got some power. He was so good that the angel had to cheat a little bit. If I can say it that way. 
and he touched the hall of his thigh and he crippled him, put it out of joint. And he still had a hold on that angel. And the angel said, it's breaking day and I have got to leave. And he said, you're not leaving until you bless me. And the angel said, what is your name? The angel knew his name, but he asked him, do you know your name? And he said, my name's Jacob. Supplanter. I'm a deceiver. I'm a trickster. I, I'm sly as a fox. And that's my name and that's my character. And the angel said, you're not going to be called Jacob any longer, but your name is going to be Israel because you are a prince with God. You have wrestled and prevailed. And now your name is Israel. And Jacob got up and he made an altar and he said this of that night. I have seen the face of God. So many times we have the blessings of God. We have the provisions of God. We have the protection of God. And we don't go further than Bethel. We need to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Almighty God that changes my name and changes the way I walk so that when every time I take a step, I know that I have to lean on the Lord because I've got a step and He's changed my character. He's changed my name. He's changed my direction and changed my destiny. We have got to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God that will not just bless me and provide for me and keep your hand upon me, but it will change me forever. Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes we stop at the house of God. I said earlier, it's more than just the house of God. It's a personal relationship. We've got to go beyond Bethel to get to Penuel, which means the face of God. Because I don't know about you, but I need God every day. Every minute of every day, I need God, not just on Sunday or church time, but I need a face-to-face -face encounter with God that will change my character, change the way I think, change the way I walk, change the way I react and how I act. We've got to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the Almighty God. Oh, hallelujah. He wrestled with God until he got a blessing. He got a name change. There's a time when we have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. I'm going to be very transparent with you right now. I'm on that quest right now. And it only comes by prayer and it only comes by fasting. It only comes with spending time with God. And there are times, I told the Lord, I said, God, there are times when I'm called to pray. And I get up in the wee hours, so my wife can tell you, in the middle of the night, where'd you go? I'm in the family room praying. And I'm not telling you that just to say, because I I'm not boasting that I'm praying. I'm just telling you that to say that God sometimes will call you to prayer. And I get down there and I feel like cr there's crickets. God, you woke me up. I came down here. I made the effort. And, and I don't feel anything. And I'm praying about everything and about everybody. And everything that comes to my mind, I'm praying. And I pray in tongues. And, I'm, I'm just, and I don't feel anything. But there's a song I heard a while back. I don't know if they sang it at Youth Congress or, or somewhere. It said, God... I'm waiting, and I'm not moving. And if it takes me three days, if it takes me five days, if it takes me 21 days, if it takes me two years of getting up and praying and not feeling a thing, I am determined that I will be changed because I have got to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Almighty God. There's nothing else that's going to change you like a face-to-face -face encounter with God. There's nothing else going to change this world like a face-to-face -face encounter with Almighty God. I think we've got the church thing down. I think we've got the Bethel down. We're faithful to church. We come to church. We worship. We know what to do. And we dance and shout about the blessings of God. I think we've got that down. 
we shout about the provisions of God and blessing me here and blessing me there and protecting me here and protecting me there and God's hand is upon us and we're all excited and that's wonderful. That's part of it. But we can't stop at the house of God. There's a difference from walking in the front door and being at this altar. And there's a difference from being at Bethel and then being at Penuel, the face-to-face encounter with God, the kind that changes. Something that changes us to the point it changes the way we talk about ourselves. I do something very periodically, and I try to watch myself. I try to break myself because I observe people a lot. I watch them in service. I watch how they worship. I, it's just my nature. I watch people. I try to see what makes them tick and what, what song excites them and what, what word excites them and just watch them. And it's just me. I'm not trying to be super spiritual. I'm just about people. And we have to have an encounter with God. It's more than just what we do publicly in the house of the Lord. Jesus said that if you pray in secret, that I will reward you openly. If you give, don't make a show of it. Just give, and I will reward you. When you give, when you pray... And when you fast, don't make a show of it. Don't get on Facebook and tell everybody, I'm fasting today. I won't be on for a while. And I'm not eating for a while. I want you all to pray for me. Pray my strength and Lord. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. You, you do it in secret. And God will reward you openly. We don't get on there and say, I've prayed 15 hours a day. And I've fasted three weeks. And I, I want you all to help me do it. No, we, get in, we do it secretly to God. And God sees and he knows. And he knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. He knows our motives. And if we're in secret praying and seeking and fasting, God will bless us and give us a face-to-face -face encounter. When we don't have the face-to-face -face encounter, we just revel in the blessings, and we don't have the face-to-face -face encounter that religion gets a hold of us. And it's not religion that I seek. It's a relationship with God that I seek. The next day, he was facing Esau. And as far as he knew, Probably certain death. But he was called of God to move forward. And faith drove him forward. Even when he thought, this could be the end of me. The scripture says, when he got close to Esau, he put the handmaids and their children out front. And then he put Leah and her children in between. And then he put Rachel and Joseph beside him. Those who were real precious and dear to his heart, he kept closer to him. And then the report comes back from the messenger and says, there's 400 men with him. We're going to be wiped out. We're going to divide the company. We're going to divide in two companies. And so if he gets one, at least one will be saved. If he gets this one, that one will be saved. And, and so he divided them. But then when he gets closer and he walks toward Esau and Esau walks toward him. Esau ran to him and grabbed him and embraced him and wept. And Jacob wept with him. Say what you want to say. Believe what you want to believe. But I believe that because of what he had at Penuel the night before, it changed the outcome of meeting his brother. Not only when you have, a, oh my God, 
Not only when you have a face-to-face encounter will it change you and change your destiny, but it will change your brother. It will change their destiny. It will melt their cold and stony and hate-filled heart and change them forever. And so when they embrace you and they see you, they'll cry and weep. They don't even know why. I should hate you. I should want to kill you. But for some reason, I don't want to feel that way anymore. And God has touched me. That's what a face-to-face encounter will do for you and for me. It not only changes us, but it changes everyone around us. And I'm closing You cannot make progress until you stop running from your biggest fear. You cannot conquer what you will not face. He received Esau's birthright by cunning craftiness and his blessing by deception. But after Penuel, he is no longer Jacob, but he is now Israel. His identity is no longer connected to Esau and what he did to Esau. I've got the blessing of God. I've got the name change. I've got the walk change. And it's not connected to me uh, buying the birthright and, and deceiving my father and get the blessing of Esau. It's now me and God. It's not what I cunningly and deceptively gathered and got for myself my own gain. But now... My name is changed. My character is changed. And now I have the blessing of God for myself. He is now Israel as he stands before Jacob and his family. The physical and the spiritual are no longer opposing each other. But now he can move forward into his destiny. What God has called him to do and to be. His experience at the latter. And the blessings and the provisions could not do for him what God did for him at Penuel. God met him at Bethel with the ladder. And he blessed him and he talked with him. Provided for him. Gave him a covenant. But he still needed Penuel. And each and every one of us need a penuel as we stand together at the expense of maybe crossing your theology this morning I don't want to upset you I just want to pose a question could it be that listen carefully could it be that You could have the Holy Ghost baptism. You could be baptized in the name. You could have a relationship with God, but not really have a face-to-face encounter with God. I'm going to hit you hard. Is God welcome in your home? Or are there too many distractions? The TV's too loud. The radio's too loud. Life itself is too loud and too busy that God tries to come in, but he is not welcome. And when he is there, he just can't get your attention. I'm over here, and we're just so busy. Things are so loud, and got this going on and that going on, and phone calls and texting and Facebook and TV, and all the electronics are just... What if Jesus wants to walk into your house today? I said earlier we talk about wanting to receive gifts, but I wonder what would happen this Christmas season if we'd say, God, what I have is so feeble to give you. You don't need money. You don't need gifts. You don't need things because you created it all. And you own a cattle on a thousand hills and you have streets paved with gold. So there's nothing that I can give you of any worth that I would hold near and dear to my heart. Except for one thing. And that is me. 
And me means my time, my will, my emotions, my trust, my faith. God, I want a face-to-face -face encounter. And so maybe if you're like me and you get up to pray and it feels like God's a million miles away, it doesn't matter. God, like I quoted the song earlier, God, I'm here and I'm not moving. I'm not leaving. I'm drawing nigh to you and I've got a promise that if I would do that, that you would draw nigh to me. And so God, this Christmas season, I offer myself to you. You offered yourself for me, but Lord, I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to give everything to you. Lord, everything I have, my home, my family, everything in my home, my bank account, my car, whatever it is, God, it all belongs to you. If you're here this morning, you say, that's what I want. I want to give God me this Christmas season. And Christmas season falls at a good time because we're starting a new year. And so when this Christmas, say, God, I'm giving you me. So we start the new year out giving ourselves to God the whole year long. If you're here and you say, that's my heart, Elder. That's the way I feel. I want you to come forward. And I want you to tell God, God, I believe what Elder said and what he was preaching about is, is for me and I want to give myself to you. God, I want a face-to-face -face encounter. I don't want to know just about you and I know about the church and know people at the church, but God, I want to know you face-to-face. -face. And so that when I feel your presence, no matter what time of day or night, I will respond to you and spend time with you and do what you would have me do and be obedient to be what you would have me be and go where you'd have me go and accomplish what you want me to accomplish, God. But I want to know you face to face. I'm tired of just Bethel. I'm tired of just church experience. I'm tired of just going through the motions. But God, I need a penewal. I need to see your face. I need to see your face in my life. I want you in my life. God, I've got to have you. God, we're here in the altar this morning. We're here and we're not moving. We want you, God. We desire you. And we reach out to you, God, for your touch and your anointing. We want to see your face, God.
walk into the throne room of God. Walk into the throne room of God and stand face to face before him today. And look upon his face. And say, God, I need a change today. I need a change today, God. I need a change today, God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I desire to see you face to face this morning. I desire to stand before you face to face. God, not seek in your hand, but seek in your face. Oh, that's it all across this building. His hands are raised. If you're standing beside somebody that has that hand raised, why don't you just reach over and take the hold of that hand right now and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. And let a touch of God come to every man, every woman. Let a touch of God rest upon every individual. Let a touch of God rest upon us. And we seek Him face to face today. God, I receive today in the name of the Lord Jesus. I receive today in the name of the Lord Jesus. I receive today in the name of the Lord Jesus. No longer want to be the same. I no longer want to be the same. God, today I need a change. Today I need a change as I seek your face. Today I need a change as I seek your face. In the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. That's it. The Lord is ministering right now. The Lord is ministering right now. The Lord is ministering right now. That's it. Keep loving Him. Keep worshiping Him. That's it. Keep positioning yourself face to face of the Lord this morning.
the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Receive from the Lord. This is a life-changing moment for some in this house. This is a life-changing moment for some in this house. This is a life-altering moment for some in this house. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Let the Lord use you right now. Let the Lord use you right now. Let the Lord touch you right now. Oh, in the name of Jesus, 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 God, I receive today, God, I receive today. transition to the 11 o'clock service. If you're physically able, I ask you to stand to your feet all across this building. No one talking to your neighbor, no one looking around. There's a visitation from God in this house right now. There's a touch of God in this house right now. There's a Shekinah glory of God in this house right now. There's a visitation from the Lord in this house right now. Now raise your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost all across this building right now. It's just you and the Lord right now. It's just you and God right now. You're walking into the throne room of the heavenlies right now. That's it. Forget who's on your left. Forget who's on your right right now in the name of Jesus. Forget who's on your left and forget who's on your right. It's just you and the Lord right now. You're standing face to face with Almighty God. That's it. Some of you feel right now something birthing on the inside of you. Some of you are feeling something you haven't felt in a long time because you've walked into the throne room of Almighty God. It's just no longer casual Christianity, no longer casual church. You're saying, God, I need you. I seek your face. I call on you. I desire to see you.